Uh, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me along this morning. I'm very honoured and very pleased to be here. Uh, inspirational to see you all here on a Saturday morning. Really, really important topic. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of how things stand in the veterinary sector. In particular, I'm going to be concentrating on the livestock and farming sector because that's the one that receives the most publicity and quite often adverse publicity, rightly or wrongly. So just to repeat what everybody else will be telling you today, this is a global issue and it is a potential Armageddon situation if we don't get antimicrobial resistance sorted out. It affects the whole world and in many, many different aspects. It's, we particularly, it's humans, are going to be affected. Animals, concern about that, but it's what happens in the animal world and how it could in the long term impact on human antimicrobial resistance that's really, really important. And again, the theme this is a one health concept is going to come out many times. But the important thing I want to derive from this slide, it requires cooperation. There is no place for medics and vets to slag each other off or blame each other. And we see this all the time. I speak to vets who say, well, until the medics get their act together, no point in us doing anything. We certainly all the time get criticised for being single-handedly responsible for the problems actually, in the veterinary sector, which is grossly unfair. Work is being done and needs to be done in both sectors. And I think that's a very, very important thing to remember. We will never, as an organisation, engage in mudslinging with other people. We want to work together to get antimicrobial resistance sorted out. So, as has already been explained very eloquently, use of antibiotics doesn't cause resistance, but when those mutations take place that allow bacteria to become resistant, it selects for them, so you end up with a highly resistant population. And of course, when medicines are used in livestock, there's a particular risk there because we're often using high doses in large numbers of animals, and so the chance of selecting for a resistant strain is potentially very, very high. You talk to vets about what their opinions are about antimicrobial resistance, and we do a survey at the British Veterinary Association looking at a fairly large sample of vets 97% of vets who we um, surveyed are concerned about antimicrobial resistance and 46% are very concerned. That doesn't necessarily mean that it always translates into action in their prescribing habits, but it is widely recognised in our profession as a very, very serious issue. And we've had mention of the O'Neill report just now. The government made three pledges in response to the O'Neill re report which particularly applied to livestock. The first one was to reduce the amount of antimicrobials being used in livestock. And again, the thinking being that if we can reduce the amount of antibiotics used, the chance of selecting for new resistant strains will be reduced. It does not necessarily mean that those strains which are already out there are going to suddenly disappear. It's gonna, they're going to carry on. It'll take a long time for resistant strains to disappear. But the idea is primarily to stop the selection pressure on new strains coming along. And we measure the total amount of antimicrobial use in livestock in the UK in terms of milligrams per kilogram. I'll explain very briefly where those figures come from in a minute. And uh, the pledge was to get below 50 milligrams per kilogram across the animal sectors by 2018 or across the livestock sectors. Second thing was to actually work with the individual livestock sectors to set specific targets for the amount of antimicrobials that would be used in their industry. So cattle, sheep, pigs, fish, poultry. The idea was to let each or encourage each sector to set its own limit. And that required veterinary surgeons and the farmers to come together. And that's quite a remarkable um, thought to try and get that sort of cooperation there. And thirdly, to significantly reduce the amount of the critically important antibiotics. We talk about the CIAs in the veterinary world, nothing to do with any US agency, but the critically important antibiotics, they are specifically third and fourth generation cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones and colistin. Those are an agreed list which comes from the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, which is the branch of DEFRA, the ministry that covers our our sector uh, as being critically important to human health and therefore actually needing particular attention from our sector. I often have to remind people about this. Antibiotics are prescription-only medicines in the veterinary sector. 
because often you see um, comments in the press that talk like it's all just like, you know, we're using them like um, sweets, and the implication being that farmers just go and pick what they want off the shelves. Now, the quality of prescribing practices will vary, there's no doubt about that, and it may not be perfect, but these are prescription-only medicines. They have to be prescribed, administered, or supplied by a veterinary surgeon. I think it's really important to remember that. So, when we look at the antimicrobial use in the livestock sector, we use the VARS report. The VARS report is produced by government through the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. And that is a very accurate figure of the sales of antibiotics into the livestock sector. It also looks at levels of um, resistance. So these are our very authoritative and accurate figures coming from government that tells us what's going on in our sector. And if we look at what was going back on in 2015, about the time, just before O'Neill was reporting, you can see on the various sectors, you can see that pig and poultry on the left were the highest users of antimicrobials. Sheep, on the right-hand side, extremely low. There's a number of reasons for that. This is using a slightly different metric to the milligrams per kilogram. This is milligrams per po population correction unit. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not going to waste time explaining that now. But there's a wide variety with pigs and poultry being the highest users of antimicrobials in the livestock sector. It's actually very difficult to assign completely accurately which species products have been used in because they are, these are sales and they're you know, coming from central government figures. They're sales of antimicrobials and of course they are licensed to be used in certain species. Sometimes they're used in more than one species. Sometimes they're used quite legitimately off-label and there could be times when they're used incorrectly off-label. And so you have to make your very best estimate at what species they're being used in. So, what's been happening to try and reduce antimicrobial resistance? We talked about the government pledges there. One of the things is the Rumour Alliance. This is the, an alliance for the responsible use of medicines in agriculture. Rumour. And BVA, together with many of the farming sectors, are members of this. And the specific thing that happened in, as a result of the O'Neill report is they set up the Targets Task Force. Targets Task Force was a regular forum where the farmers, so the sector councils who represent different livestock species, the vets who specialise in working in those species, and government with the Veterinary Medicines Directorate and the Food Standards Agency, and indeed the pharmaceutical industry, were all present. And this, I think, was quite a remarkable achievement because in this forum, people worked together. It wasn't the government telling everybody they must do this and everyone going, well... Yeah, whatever will do something to keep you happy. It wasn't the vets telling the farmers what they had to do. And it wasn't the farmers kicking and saying, no, we're not going to do it. It was actually everybody recognising that something had to happen. And it was a very, very collaborative and very, very effective forum getting people together to set targets for each species group. And if we look at the results of what's been happening in the livestock sector... This is the milligrams per kilograms based on government figures used in livestock in the UK uh, each year. And you can see that the pledge was to get it below 50, which actually was achieved by 2016, well ahead of schedule, because the figures take a year or 18 months to come through, so they're slightly historic. But the 2016 figures were already down at 45, and the latest results, which have just come through for last year, is now down at 37. Now, this gives no cause for complacency whatsoever but what it does show is there's been a huge effort by those people in the sector to reduce their antimicrobial usage to think twice before antimicrobials are used and to actually work very hard to reduce it this isn't made up or aspirational this is what's actually happened and I think that's something that is often overlooked often when we hear uh, reports about the terrible situation of livestock use of antimicrobials people tend to forget that the UK is actually making some improvements, I'm not saying it's perfect, and they're conflating that with the global situation, which often is a disaster. And often that is not seen in the reports that are coming out. If we look at CIA sales, critically important antibiotics, OK, I won't waste a lot of time on this, but you can see each of those, the three categories that I mentioned earlier, are dropping dramatically. So 2017, again, these figures have just come out a year later, 
people are often talking about colistin and why are veterinary surgeons using colistin? Well, I think you can probably just about see that bar for colistin. I think a total, a total of seven kilograms in the whole of the UK was used in this year. It's almost unheard of to use colistin. And unfortunately, those people are often trying to make a very sensible point about reducing antimicrobials and CIAs, often get hung up on colistin. Well, actually, colistin really isn't an issue, I don't think, in the UK at the moment, because it's been brought in hand and brought under control. I'm not going to go through all these figures, but you can just see this gives you uh, an idea of the percentage reductions in some sectors in antimicrobial use. So if we look at the far right column, for example, which is the use of CIAs, you can see, for example, in pigs compared to 2016, so that's in a year, 63% reduction. Um, poultry industry, 75% reduction. They've been eliminated in laying hens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not just trying to say, oh, isn't it all wonderful, but there have been some really important moves there. And you can see there the amount of use dropping each year um, for the last uh, three years. So how do we as vets try and promote that reduction of antibiotic use? Everybody in the industry understands how important it is. There's always a variation of vets and farmers. Some will be really up on this voluntarily um, making huge efforts and there'll be those who are not quite so interested and get dragged along kicking, kicking and streaming kicking and screaming, I should say. But as veterinary surgeons, we have a huge responsibility to improve antimicrobial usage by actually preventative medicine, which is what we should, should be doing all the time. So you know, improved husbandry and housing, reducing stocking densities, having better ventilation rates, better basic husbandry and basic conditions. It's exactly the same with humans. The way you live and the way you're fed and the amount of space and clean water and everything else makes a huge difference to your illness and your need for antibiotics. Colostrum, which is the milk that calves and lambs receive in their first 12 hours of life, which contains vital antibiotics, not antibiotics, I'm so sorry, antibodies, antibodies. You know, if they don't get colostrum administered properly in a timely manner, those animals are far more likely to be sick. Simple husbandry requires quite a lot of effort on the part of the farm to get that sorted. We need to have good hygiene, biosecurity, animal movements, bringing disease in. Very, very important to have that under control. And of course, sometimes vaccination can be a huge help in reducing the amount of disease we get. But the last line is probably the most important, endemic diseases. We have several very serious endemic diseases in UK agriculture. One of them is bovine viral disease virus which can cause a number of problems in cattle. It's a viral disease, obviously. It can be controlled through appropriate actions. And we need to push very hard to get farmers and, of course, their vets to understand and to control this disease. And there's a number of schemes out there. We've got BBD Free England, which is going on at the moment. Scotland has almost eliminated BBD through some very proactive centralised government uh, initiatives. Um, so BBD, removing BBD, we know reduces the amount of disease and the use of antibiotics on farms. You've got figures to prove that. And there's a number of other diseases there which can be controlled, but it requires some effort and some thinking and some planning. And farmers have been doing this for years, some more than others, and people are getting much, much better at this. The AMR um, situation is really driving this. Controlling endemic diseases which are not controlled by antibiotics, getting those controlled will make a huge difference into the levels of um, antimicrobials that need to be used to treat secondary or symptoms that uh, people feel that um, antimicrobials might be needed for. In dairy cows, the treatment and prevention of mastitis is a huge part of veterinary work. Obviously, the cow's udder is the, probably the most overused part of the cow if she's a milking cow. And part of that, unfortunately, is infections occurring in a number of ways and a number of situations. So traditionally, we've treated those with antibiotics. We still do, but there's been a huge amount of work done to try and target treatments more effectively, use drugs which are not CIAs, very, very important. And the way we manage cows, I'm not going to go into details of this now, where we manage cows to prevent infection and not routinely use antibiotics to bring them under control is very, very important. So that's moved on a great deal. 
Still a huge amount of work to be done. Please don't think I'm trying to say all sorted. But there is an understanding and a movement towards improving these things. Disease called watery mouth in lambs. It's very easy to have a situation where your lambs get ill at sort of 24 hours old. And traditionally, farmers have used antibiotics to treat that. It's all about prevention. Good colostrum, good hygiene, um, good protocols there. And actually having the courage to say to your clients, no, we're not going to give you your normal prescription of antibiotics for your watery mouth problems. A, you probably haven't got a problem. B, we're going to sit down with you and sort out how you prevent it. And only if we've done all that and we've still got problems will we actually start thinking about using antibiotics as necessary. That's a difficult one because if you rush in and make those management changes and you get it wrong and a lot of lambs die, you've got a huge welfare problem on your hands. So it needs to be done very, very carefully. As well as um, the sales figures that come from central government, the amount of antibiotics going into the system, huge efforts have been made now to try and record usage more accurately. So all antimicrobial use is recorded by law, but it's not always easy to, um, to capture that from a centralised system. A lot of people keep individual farm records, and so it's really difficult to collate those into national figures to see how much the figures for usage collate with the figures of supply. So supply, I think, is accurate and very reliable. So we have things like the e-medicines book where the pig industry, which is very integrated, they actually enter their antimicrobial use into a central database um, which can be used. So that's a very, very uh, useful thing. Um, British Poultry Council, they've really worked hard, understanding they're an industry that traditionally has used a lot of antibiotics, They've worked really hard to bring it under control. And as we saw with the laying sector, uh, they've eliminated the use of um, cr critically important antibiotics. Their industry just doesn't use it, which is highly commendable. Vet Compass is one of two systems out there where small animal practices are recording their prescribing, as well as diagnosis of, 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 of treatments, into a central database so we can get some accurate figures about what is going on in first opinion clinical practice um, in small animals. There's also been some amazing initiatives from the British Equine Veterinary Association trying to get a, a real handle on antimicrobial use in horses and the Small Animal Veterinary Association, which Professor Dawson will have been involved with, um, the Protect Scheme, some really good work there, which I haven't got time to talk about, but giving rational advice on good prescribing decisions and recording usage. As vets, we work really hard, certainly the British Veterinary Association, the representative organisation, work really hard with government to keep these things, firstly, being high in the minds of our members so that they're doing what they should do, but also feeding into government. So we've already seen this um, antimicrobial resistance strategy, which expires at the end of this year, we had a meeting last year with Dame Sally Davis, who's there speaking, and uh, Nigel Gibbons, who was then the Chief Veterinary Officer, um, to bring people together to talk about these issues. Because, as I say, fundamentally, there's a divide in thinking. Vets are often very unaware of what's happening in the medical profession and vice versa, and it's absolutely essential that we at least have a common understanding on that. One of the things we did is we produced this poster which theoretically could go in vets and doctors' waiting rooms about don't expect to be prescribed antibiotics. You, know, you won't necessarily need or get prescribed antibiotics. And of course, if we can get that message through to our clients in the waiting room, A, they'll have their expectations managed for their treatment of their pets, but also their understanding where they play to, their, to, to them themselves when they go and see their doctors. So there could be some spillover effects there. And I think perhaps the most significant to think about this poster, if you look at the bottom, it's been approved by the British Veterinary Association and the British Medical Association. Doctors and vets coming together, Public Health England and the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, which is a part of DEFRA responsible for uh, drugs, and of course the Antibiotic Guardian Scheme, which is a wonderful scheme. So bringing those groups together, highly, highly significant, I think. Probably more significant than what the poster says, if I'm quite honest. We have a seven-point plan. I mean, these things are, are quite useful, but this is something we can make sure all our members have. They can have it up in their staff rooms, their coffee rooms, 
Sometimes they give them to their farmers if they're farm vets. But just to keep people thinking about how they prescribe responsibly and helping to prevent antimicrobial resistance. So seven fairly simple points. It's all about keeping it in people's minds. So just some concluding thoughts. AMR is a really important issue. It's a global issue and it's absolutely potentially Armageddon. I wonder about my children. Will they be able to be treated by antibiotics if they get ill? We've already heard some pretty powerful stories. I mean, this is really, really serious. It's not a joke. Um, medics and vets and dentists and pharmacists must cooperate with, with each other on this problem and not try and blame the other. We can always blame each other and achieve absolutely nothing. That's easy. And it is a true one health problem. It requires that cooperation from all bodies. And that's not just sort of talking, that's actually thinking and communicating and actually working together. There's no doubt that in the UK, antimicrobial use in the livestock sector is falling significantly. The total amount used is not the only issue, but it's an important start. It's really good to see the usage dropping. Um, there is absolutely no room for complacency. So although I think there are some really good news stories here, it's not a case, oh, we've got it all sorted, everything is fine. Not at all. But we are starting to move in the right direction. And there's been fantastic buy-in from all sectors. I think there's often a confusion between what's happening globally and what's happening in the UK. So frequently we see reports in the press saying it's all a total disaster, farmers are doing this, farmers are doing that, farmers, 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 and their vets, they're all bloody useless, you know, they don't care. Well, you know, I think there is some good news there what's happening in the UK, but that needs to be separated out from the global situation. And I think that's very, very important. People are very careful not to ever say there's been some limited improvements in UK agriculture. I think that's really quite important that actually that is reported more responsibly. As a veterinary organisation, we would always say that antibiotics are necessary on occasions. We could stop using, we could ban using antibiotics tomorrow, have zero use, but we would see the most awful welfare problems be completely unacceptable to everybody. Whether you, whether you approve of farming or not, pets, farm animals, they would suffer terribly if there was no antibiotics available. And we would fight very hard to say that the antibiotics should be always available, but strictly controlled in the way we use them. So I think it's very important that people don't just say, oh, we get rid of all antibiotics in the animal sector, because that would be an absolute disaster for animal welfare. But through careful thinking and changing attitudes, the amount we use should be dropping and is dropping quite significantly. Thank you very much.